Robin, thank you very much for guiding us through reading these wonderful two sculptures, which are Ken Price and, and Ron Nagel, and for making that relationship between our show and, well, our two shows. Thank you very much. So concluding today's program, it is my distinct hon honor to introduce Dr. Peter Sells. In 1957, Peter Sells published German Expressionist painting, the first history of the movement. A year later, he was appointed chief curator of painting and sculpture exhibitions at the, modern, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, where he organized exhibitions including new images of man and solo shows of Mark Rothko, Max Beckman, Jean Dubuffet, and Alberto Giacometti. In 1965, he joined the faculty of the History of Art at the University of California, Berkeley, where he also served as the founding director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Among the monographs, he has written art books on Sam Francis and Eduardo Chillida. His most recent book, Art of Engagement, was awarded the Mori Award by the College Art Association as the best book of the year in 2006. He joins us today to discuss the late work of Max Beckman, Welcome, Dr. Self. I can't think of a greater contrast than Ken Price and Max Beckman. <laughs> and I like them both, and Ken Price was in my punk show at the Berkeley Museum. So, this is the sinking of the Titanic, a painting that Max Beckman did just prior to World War I. And it was these romantic academic paintings that made him a very, the, you know, one of the most famous young painters in Germany at the time. Uh, during World War I, uh, he served um, in the medical corps, and after that, his work made a tremendous change. He came back uh, with a face like this, with a, I mean, this dry point here, an essence of tragedy, and then soon after that, he painted one of his most famous paintings, uh, called The Night, uh, which in a way prefigures uh, Picasso's Guernica by 15 years, and it's one of the great war paintings and the horrors of war paintings ever done. My talk today, however, will be only the 1950, the last year of Beckman's life. And let me start with a picture uh, in the exhibition here now. It's by no means uh, the best painting in the Albright Knox collection, nor is it the best painting by Max Beckman. But it's a good way to start. The painting is right here next door. It's a very, very good painting that he did in 1950. Uh, um, he had just uh, left St. Louis, but during the war he uh, took refuge in Amsterdam after Hitler called the Janet, what he called the Janet artist, uh, like Picasso or Beckman. If they would, he, Hitler said, in 1938, if they will continue what they are doing, they're either crazy, in which case they have to be sent to an insane asylum, or they're criminal, in which case they have to go to jail. The, uh, the day after Hitler made this pronouncement, Max Beckman packed his bag and went to Amsterdam, where he spent the war years. After the war, he got a job teaching in St. Louis, and then in 1950, 1949, he moved to New York. And he painted this picture here called Hotel Lobby, which is based on the Oak Room in the Plaza Hotel. Uh, Beckman liked the places like that. He would go to, to the plaza uh, the, the, with all his elegance to, to, to see and be seen. At the same time, the next day, he would go to the Bowery uh, to, to watch the Bowery bums. He was un unbelievably busy at that time. Uh, I remember uh, for, uh, reading his diary, uh, he read, uh, I mean, I read uh, Thomas Mann's Dr. Faustus. It took me about three and a half months. Uh, Beckman did it in a couple of weeks. Uh, at the same time, uh, he uh, got a job uh, teaching at the Brooklyn Museum School, uh, I think three times a week. He traveled a lot to see more of America. And, um, but in this painting here, which is about as two-dimensional as Beckman ever got, usually there's much deeper space, but he, at that point he wanted to try and work with, with two-dimensionality, and all these people crowded, unbelievably crowded together, uh, and um, uh, it's a really 
can be seen as an existential interpretation of life and the meaninglessness of life, these people who have no contact whatsoever with each other. A few years, a few months later, he produced a major, major work uh, called Falling Man, which is now in the National Gallery in Washington. And here we see a large, heavy body, probably somebody Beckman associated himself with, falling in, uh, through, the, through the sky, coming from the heavenly regions above. He's on his way to Earth, uh, passing in his flight a, a burning house um, whose smoke intermingles with clouds. Or, uh, and he travels past uh, these burning dwellings of mankind toward the exotic flowers down below, uh, which uh, streets toward the man and, and the hands. And there are birds or angels, we don't know, floating in the sky. Uh, Kwapi, his widow, recalled that uh, he told her, it is not Icarus, but rather men condemned to fall to earth and live there with its horrors and beauties cast from the dream boat in which the angels continue to move on. The sky, as you see, merges into, a deep, into the deep blue sky, um, and the falling man can be seen, in a way, as an allegory of life and its end. And Beckman himself, at the end, which Beckman himself called the final transition into the great unknown. We can also relate to Martin Heidegger, who in his book, Being and Time, writes about man as being hurled into existence and condemned to life. This is his last self-portrait. The, the colors are unbelievable. Uh, Beckman didn't use blue very much, but here it is very much of a blue, uh, this blue jacket, the brown background, uh, the, the black stretch of the canvas uh, on, on the, uh, the right here, uh, on, on the left. And no, also noted the left hand with a cigarette. Beckman always had a cigarette in his hand. Um, stretch out and seems to be shaking. His eyes seem to be looking left with no indication what he may be looking at. Now in 1950 that he has survived the hard years of the war in Amsterdam, he portrays himself much less secure than he did 15 years earlier uh, when he showed himself like that at the height of his glory in Germany in uh, 1928. Uh, as I said, he went on frequent trips, and he got a job in 1949 uh, for the summer school at Mills College. And this is a picture called, uh, of course, San Francisco. He's now 52 years old. He took this long trip uh, from, Lucene, from uh, St. Louis to San Francisco. And at that time, Mills College, we thought summer school, was a very important place. There was a German art historian named Neumeyer. He brought, for the summer school, he brought artists of the quality of Feininger, Leger, Maholi, and Beckmann in succession to teach at the Mills College campus, where Beckmann also made a series of small paintings of this nice campus. Um, and here, we see this road going very, very fast around the uh, Palace of Fine Arts, you see on the left, uh, which, uh, uh, and it's, it's very small compared to the big uh, sailboat uh, in the water there. And then you see the, uh, these skyscrapers who are wobbling, uh, and, uh, and then the sky is above. And then on the right, uh, very important, is this ladder. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. And in the very foreground, you, can, uh, you see these crosses. Uh, these crosses may uh, r relate to the, the cemetery that he saw out in the Presidio, but they also, I think, relate to something else. Um, um, referring to, uh, probably signifying his pre preoccupation with death at that time, and he died later on that year. Again and again, there's this mysterious letter on the right. In his letters and diaries, by the way, uh, you know, he's not just a realist. Uh, he called himself a realist of inner visions. In his letters, he would write about the unknown space. And like Kandinsky, Malevich, and Mondrian, he was certainly occupied with the spiritual life. He was interested in theosophy, and we found an annotated volume of 
uh, Madame Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine in his library. Uh, he delved in the Vedas and Indian philosophy. When he wrote about the fourth dimension, he did not have Einstein's idea of space and time in mind, which was so, so widely discussed at the time, but he meant the fourth dimension was the spirit. And we see a painting or a drawing like this called Meeting, and this is, certainly has religious, certainly spiritual overtones, that's 1950. Uh, in his diary, he wrote at the time, I continued reading Pythagoras and determined that one cannot conceive of death by this being called to another level of consciousness. One of the great paintings he did at that time is called Carnival Mask, Green, Violet, and Pink. It's like many of his, the St. Louis Museum has many of his, has the largest collection of Beckman paintings in this country. It's also called Columbine. It's also called Mardi Gras News. Nude. Uh, now, note, for instance, uh, the black, little black crosses next to the woman's thigh. Like Picasso, uh, Beckman often painted circus performance, Saldin banks, clowns, harlequins, mountebanks, pierros, uh, people who live like the artist himself on the margins of society. He here wears a black mask through which she glares at the, future, at the viewer. Her red lips are sealed. The upper part of her black clad body, a broad shouldered body, is straight stiff. In her left hand, she holds a prominent dancer's cap. Both the bobby and the dissonant colors are certainly threatening. She sits on a table or a drum with legs splayed, splayed, with legs splayed open, thighs denoting sexual enticement. She is both welcoming and menacing. Let me, I mean, is it, when you see this painting, it is really an amazing, an amazing image. He painted one of the last paintings he did. I want to put him in context now with two other paintings of women done by major artists of the same time. So to put him in this kind of context. They are the, we just saw them before. They are the Kooning's women. We saw that just 10 minutes ago. Then also in New York at the same time. But these, the Kooning's women are truly ferocious and predatory. The Kooning seems to have taken the body apart and reassembled it. Then these shamelessly erotic women were painted with torrents of uh, dripping paint, creating a vibrant fabric of color. He painted them close up, giving them an uncanny intimacy. The savage smile on these Amazons we saw so before these advertisements on like Miss Rangold, we saw in the subway posters with this uh, uh, smile, on the, after the American smile, like you have to smile when you have your picture taken. Uh, uh, the, the Kooning was very much aware of that, coming from Holland, he didn't smile so much. And then, um, also the same, same year, but then, now done in Paris rather than New York, uh, uh, one of Dubuis's theories of the Corps des Dames, uh, whereas Beckman's innovative painting are still in the tradition of European uh, uh, figure painting, and the Kooning's own a great debt, as we saw, to, cu to Cubism, uh, Dubuis's painting are on a total, a total attack on traditional painting. His woman, like the coarsely textured map of the female body, these women are cut off at the size, thin arms around the small profiled head, her large buttocks arched against this uh, savage evocation of a never eradicating archetype, really going back to Paleolithic uh, fertility effigies. Everyone's been the next of the time talking about this last triptych, the Argonauts. In April 1959, Still in St. Louis, a began, began painting his last and his most resolved of his nine triptychs. It refers the Argonauts to the ancient Greek myth of the heroes who brought back the Golden Fleece, who had to cross the Black Sea going back to Greece. Many interpretations have been written about it, including a very recent one in which this author tries to identify, identify that these personages as individuals of Beckman's acquaintances. 
certainly barking up the wrong tree. This is not what they are. <laughs> Let me try my own interpretation, which I first published in a scholarly volume, a scholarly treatise, it was published in Frankfurt in 1981. The left panel, which Beckman originally called the artist in this model, shows the painter attacking the canvas. We know that Beckman was rereading Van Gogh's letters at the time and saw the Van Gogh show at the Met at that time. It seems quite possible that he identified with, with Van Gogh's uh, painting of the portrait that he did of the, uh, his portrait of Gauguin when both artists were in Arles. This one, uh, with her sword, can be threatening, brandishing the sword. She's undoubtedly Medea. She can be seen as threatening, as I said, and as protecting the artist. There are always many different interpretations uh, possible. Uh, this book, as it is spoken, uh, was published in Frankfurt and Beckman's uh, Nine Cryptics. It's a very large book, and many, many different interpretations uh, of these um, uh, triptychs have been written. The right panel depicts the chorus of Greek tragedies. The chorus here is a quartet with calm women playing. The whole triptych seems with its deeply reverberating colors much more peaceful than the more assertive er earlier ones. I'd like to have a qu quote here. Edward Said, who wrote how the artist in his old age can crown his lifetime of aesthetic endeavor in harmony and resolution. We can relate that to the, old, the late paintings of artists like Titian and Rembrandt, and right now, the Matisse's cutout. Now, you can also uh, see the painter's canvas going up, uh, going up and then forming a rectangle with the ladder going on uh, in, this, in the central pan panel. It was noting that the German word Staffelei signifies both ladder and easel in German. So in a way, uh, that's the easel, but it's also, in a way, uh, the, the canvas itself is the, the artist's proving ground. But, it, but here, as in other paintings we looked at, it has also a spiritual meaning. Here the ladder is not empty, but serves as a structure of which the wise old man emerges from the sea, confronting the Argonauts about to set out uh, on their journey. On the right panel is Jason, a beautiful young man who made his first appearance in Beckman's work 40 years earlier in an early work called Young Men by the Sea. Uh, these uh, figures appear again and again very differently in the master's work. Jason's elbow, elbow, as you see, rests on a red rock, inspired clearly by the red boulders uh, Beckman had seen the year before in the Garden of the Gods in the Rocky Mountains near Boulder where he was teaching summer school. On his wrist, Jason holds a fabulous large bird that must refer to the bird which Aphrodite he gave to Jason to help him on his journey to pass through the clashing of rocks of the Bosporus. The gentle young man in the center, also nude, with laurel wreaths in his hair and a golden bracelet on his wrist, must refer to Orpheus, whose lyre lies on the platform below. The old man, maybe Phibius, the king who advised the Argonauts to send a dove out from the boat to explore the pass, and who was later blinded by the gods for prophesizing the future. But the old man may also be Glaucus, the builder of the Argo, who later became the sea god, also again endowed with the gift of prophecy. The triptychs also are undoubtedly indebted to Beckman's reading of the study of the myths of the Argonauts by Bachhofen, the Swiss cultural historian, who interpreted the saga as a final encounter of the Greeks with the so-called barbarians, who in fact were an older culture in which the female gender prevailed and provided greater harmony with nature. We should also notice that in the pink sky above, Beckman painted a purple eclipse of the sun outlined by a fiery, by a fiery orange ring. In September 49, Beckman kept his diaries, we can read so much, 
uh, expressed his astonishment when reading about the sunspot in an essay by Alexander von Humboldt, in which Humboldt com uh, commented, uh, and then he, uh, Beckman commented, never knew the sun was dark and very shaken. Two orange planets orbiting between the day's, day's sun and the crescent moon were seen in these historic ellipses. The old man, whoever may be, points, as Beckman would have said, to a new plane of consciousness. On December 15, in his last letter to his son Peter, he wrote, I'm just painting a trip to the Argonauts, and in Dodona we shall see each other again. Dodona was the oldest of the Greek oracles. The day after he completed this last Beckman, a Beckman went walking in Central Park, or went to through Central Park, to an exhibition called New Painting in America, in which the self-portrait in blue jacket we saw earlier was part, part, was part of the show. And Beckman wanted to see that show, but on the way to the, to the, to the Metropolitan Museum, uh, he had a fatal heart attack. This work is now in the National Gallery in Washington, donated by his widow. Personally, I like to mention that back in 1963, when I was working on the Beckman retrospective for the Museum of Modern Art, Guapi, the widow, went on a long vacation. And instead of sending the, uh, the, uh, the trip to storage as he did before, she offered the deposit, the deposit in my apartment in New York. I was able to live with this great, great painting for three months. That was one of the greatest experiences you can have ever. I, in the retrospective that I did after that, in the Museum of Modern Art, we had a hexagon of, in which six of the triptychs were confronting each other, and some people uh, came and see this and compared to the Trotto's Arena Chapel in Padua, uh, a modern version of Trotto's. That wasn't bad either. Okay, thank you very much.